Hi, everyone, and welcome to this special presentation of Waypoint Talks. Uh, this is co-hosted by the Waypoint Research Institute and Waypoint's Medical Staff Association. Um, I'd like to thank you all for, for joining us. We're very excited to have Dr. Ross Green here with us today. And um, before we get started, I'd like to introduce my co-hosts. So um, hiding behind the Waypoint Research Institute logo is the executive assistant uh, to the VP of Research and Academics at Waypoint, that's Jessica Kasten. And we also have Dr. Rob Meter, who is the Medical Director of Family, Child and Youth Mental Health. He is going to be acting as our moderator for today. Um, I'd also like to encourage all of you to join us for our future sessions. We have another one coming up on April 19th that's gonna be focusing on the impact of COVID-19 on healthcare practitioners. So that's gonna be very exciting and probably very relevant to all of you. Um, just some record, uh, sorry, some housekeeping before we get started. Um, obviously the session is being recorded. If you prefer to stay anonymous, I encourage you to rename yourself. Um, while the recording is on, uh, all of our participants will be muted, so you will not be able to ask questions directly. Um, we'd like to encourage you to put all of your questions into the Q&A section down at the bottom of your screen. Um, and there you can also upvote any questions that have already been asked that you would really like to see asked. Um, so in that vein, before you put one into the Q&A, please make sure that the question hasn't already been asked by somebody else. <laughs> um, we will do our best to, um, to indicate whether that question has been answered live or type in a the answer to the question uh, as we are able to, but uh, Dr. Green will uh, address those at the end of the session. Um, any other random chatter, comments, suggestions, etc., please feel free to put into the chat. Um, but just a reminder, we will not be moderating the chat for questions. Um, we'll also put announcements into the chat section and uh, links that you might be able to follow as well. Um, and then uh, in the coming days, we will send out an email to all of you just with um, a participant satisfaction survey, uh, an attendance certificate, as well as an indication of where you can go to get the recording as well as any other materials. So with that, I'd like to pass this off to Dr. Rob Meter to introduce Dr. Green. Yes, <clears throat> thanks Laura for, uh, for that introduction and for getting us started and thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, to this uh, session with Dr. Ross Green. Uh, some of you uh, maybe attended the talk at 1030, which was, which was fantastic. And this is more of a smaller group uh, approach to how do we use CPS in our offices as physicians. And I think that's our goal today is to really give you an approach to behavior problems in kids. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Ross Green. Uh, many of you probably already know him. He is a clinical psychologist and the founder and director of the nonprofit organization called Lives in the Balance. Um, he is best known as the originator of the collaborative and proactive solutions approach. Um, for over 20 years, he served at Harvard Medical School on, and on the adjunct faculty right now at the psychology department at Virginia Tech and the faculty of science at University of Technology in Sydney, Australia. Uh, I don't know how he commutes between both those campuses, but I'm sure he finds a way to do it. Um, and many of you probably know him as the best-selling author of the books, The Explosive Child, uh, Lost at School, and Raising Human Beings, all fantastic books, which I often recommend to my families and, and children that I see. So um, before this started, we did have a bit of a back and forth about, you know, an unmet expectation when it comes to how I spell behavior. Um, and you'll see in this talk that I relented and apologized for us Canadians throwing that extra hue at you in the word behavior. Um, and Dr. Um, uh, Green has proceeded with using the American spelling. So that was our little approach to collaborative problem solving, I guess. So without further ado, I will um, have Dr. Green take the microphone and start us off. And then we will do sort of a back and forth during the talk. Uh, welcome, Dr. Green, and thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much. And, um, you know, in the spirit of collaboration, I should have left in behavior with a U in some places. Um, the uh, editor in me has trouble um, not being obsessive about <laughs> spelling. So um, we'll make sure that behavior with a U is in there for a few of them in the future. 
you also spell pediatrician different than we do here. Um, so that, that got fixed as well. Um, so this, this was truly a collaborative effort uh, between me and uh, Rob. Um, so I'm gonna start off and then Rob's gonna join in and um, hopefully this will be very useful information for you all. I'm really glad that we're able to do this through technology. And that of course is how I commute between Virginia and Australia uh, most of the time, it's through technology. Um, let's go. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna give you a little bit of background in collaborative and proactive solutions. But this is a really important issue for nutritions and family physicians because you are often the first ones to hear about a child's concerning behaviors. And the lenses that you are wearing may end up being the lenses that the parents who you're working with are wearing. Where you steer them, very good chance that is where they will go. And so what a crucial role pediatricians and family physicians play in the lives of kids with concerning behaviors and their caregivers, um, boy, some a, a very crucial role. What I'm gonna do here though is orient you to the CPS model because there are some very big differences. Um, first of all, the CPS model isn't actually focused on the kid's behavior. And that's big right off the bat, yes, I understand that parents are usually coming in expressing concerns about the behavior. And of course that's legit. By the way, many parents feel like they haven't been believed. It is very common for parents to say to me as a clinician, you're the first one who believed that what we were telling you about what life is like in our household. My mentality is always, why would we not believe them? I, I'm having trouble coming up with any reasons that parents would make this stuff up. But a very important piece of this model is to actually move people off of focusing primarily on a kid's concerning behaviors. And that's true whether it is whining or crying or pouting, sulking, or screaming, swearing, hitting, spitting, um, kicking, destroying. In the CPS model, Behaviors are just signals. Behavior is just the fever. Behavior is simply the way the kid is communicating that they are having difficulty meeting certain expectations. And it is those expectations that we are primarily focused on in this model. And now we are beginning to steer caregivers to where we want them to go. We are going to be empathic about the behaviors, but we are going to steer them in a direction that is not primarily focused on those concerning behaviors. Behind every concerning behavior is an expectation that a kid was having difficulty meeting. The behavior comes second, it's late. The expectation the kid was having difficulty meeting, that's early, that comes first. We are doing families a tremendous favor by helping them focus on unmet expectations rather than the concerning behaviors that are being caused by those unmet expectations. And as it says on the screen, what we call those unmet expectations in this model is unsolved problems. By the way, also known as problems that have yet to be solved, also known as problems that are waiting to be solved. Why are they waiting to be solved? Because if caregivers and the professionals who are helping them are primarily focused on behaviors and not the problems that are causing those behaviors, well, what the advice that we're giving people to deal with concerning behaviors, rewarding behaviors we like so as to see more of them, punishing behaviors we don't like so as to see less of them, those strategies don't solve any of the problems that are causing the behaviors. But if we are helping caregivers focus on and solve the problems that are causing those behaviors, not only will the problems get solved, the behaviors will subside because it is only unsolved problems that cause concerning behaviors. Solved problems don't. 
So if a kid is meeting a caregiver's expectations, those kids' caregivers aren't likely to be complaining about the kids' concerning behaviors. The kid is meeting expectations. It's the kids who are having difficulty meeting expectations, whether that's brushing teeth before going to bed at night or cleaning one's room or doing one's homework or getting off the Xbox to come in for dinner or participating in virtual learning, an unsolved problem that has come to us thanks to COVID-19. Um, uh, if a kid is having difficulty meeting those expectations and adults are insisting that those expectations be met, now we do have an unsolved problem and there's an excellent chance that the kid is exhibiting concerning behaviors to communicate that they are having difficulty meeting that expectation. So just on one slide, we have just shifted quite a bit from overt behavior to the problems that are causing those behaviors, from behavior modification to problem solving. Now, believe it or not, that shift could take place in a 10 minute office visit. That shift can be done in 10 minutes, but we're gonna go a little bit further. But to begin with, the whole process of steering people begins with their lenses. Old lenses, here are some of the obsolete, archaic things we've been saying about kids with concerning behaviors. Manipulative, attention-seeking, coercive, unmotivated, limit testing. And of course, the traditional approach to concerning behaviors is behavior modification. The new lenses. What's making it difficult for the kid to respond adaptively to life's problems and frustration, lagging skills? By the way, that seemingly little point is massive, but it is also supported by 40 to 50 years of research on kids with concerning behaviors. A kid responding poorly to life's problems and frustrations is not lacking motivation. That kid is lacking skills. In the global areas of flexibility, adaptability, frustration tolerance, problem solving, that is a very big shift in lens for many caregivers. And by the way, not only is it more compassionate, it's more accurate. Some caregivers, parents, this is gonna happen, feel guilty when they come to appreciate what they didn't know about their own kid. And when they begin to reflect on how they've been trying to quote unquote, help the kid, unsolved problems, as you already know, are the expectations that the kid is having difficulty meeting. So what interventions does that lead us to? First, we've got to identify those problems and we've got to solve them. But we've got to solve them in a certain way, collaboratively and proactively. Us caregivers are used to solving problems unilaterally and emergently. So there is another big shift. But that shift is made possible by us helping caregivers, either in the office or through resources we can turn them on to by helping caregivers identify a kid's lagging skills and unsolved problems proactively. As I always say, once caregivers identify a kid's lagging skills and unsolved problems, they have the information that's been missing. We, we've, they've known what the kid's concerning behaviors were for a very long time. They may even have some psychiatric diagnoses to attach to those behaviors to summarize them. They probably have theories about how the kid got to be this way. But the information that's been missing, what are this kid's lagging skills? What are this kid's unsolved problems? That can be done proactively. You can help make it so. Once the information that's been missing has been identified, the whole enterprise can be almost exclusively proactive. 
So I should give you one of the lines that I frequently use with the parents and also educators who I work with and staff members in therapeutic facilities. I'm going to get you out of the heat of the moment. We have got to get you out of the heat of the moment. Nothing good is going to happen in the heat of the moment. The only options available to caregivers in the heat of the moment are crisis management strategies. Goodness, we're only two slides in and we've come a long way already. Well, we're gonna help them identify those lagging skills and unsolved problems so as to make the entire enterprise as proactive as possible. We may even help them prioritize because if the kid has been exhibiting concerning behaviors for a very long time, this kid's gonna have a lot of unsolved problems, a lot of expectations. The kid has been having difficulty reliably meeting. We're not gonna be able to work on them all at once. In fact, we generally recommend that caregivers never work on more than three unsolved problems at any given point in time. More than that, both the kid and the caregivers are gonna get overwhelmed. So by the way, what you have walking into your office are overwhelmed caregivers. They are overwhelmed. A good way to help them get less overwhelmed, just to walk us through where we've been so far. What's overwhelming for the parents is the behaviors. What's overwhelming is the fact that the behaviors feel unpredictable, very common for caregivers to say, we never know when he's gonna blow. He always gets upset from out of the blue. Once they figure out what the kid's lagging skills and unsolved problems are, this is a very predictable kid. And those things that they've been saying turn out to be untrue. Now they're settling down because rather than having them continue to target behaviors which feel unpredictable and in the heat of the moment, we are identifying very discrete unsolved problems that they can begin solving proactively. And we are letting them know that it's actually okay to set some of their long list of unsolved problems aside for now, because they got bigger fish to fry. And if they try to solve all those problems at once, they will end up solving none of them at all. So now, how are they going to solve those problems? They have three options. In this model, they're really only using two of them, but three exist in the real world. Those options are called plan A, plan B, and plan C. The one that they are almost never going to be using in this model is plan A. And what's amazing about plan A is that at least at this point in human evolution, it's still the one that is most popular. But let's start with plan C. Plan C is where we are setting a particular problem aside, at least for now. Not because we're giving in, not because we're giving up, there's actually no giving in or giving up in this model. That will be of great comfort to caregivers who have an allergic reaction to the concepts of giving in and giving up. Thank goodness, neither is happening in this model. No, the reason we are setting problems aside for now is number one, because we're prioritizing. Once again, you can't work on everything at once. And also because we're stabilizing. In the case, of the very volatile, reactive, unstable kids that I tend to enjoy working with the most, removing some expectations for now is a very good way of tamping down the flames. Um, I'm always asking the question, which would I rather use to stabilize a kid? An atypical antipsychotic medication or plan C? Definitely plan C. It has no side effects. Now, does that mean that I'm not working with kids who are on atypical antipsychotic medications? No, I got kids who are on atypical antipsychotic medications. That just tells you that plan C and plan B weren't enough to stabilize. But I'm always amazed at the number that plan B and plan C was enough to stabilize. That leaves us with only two other plans, A and B. Both represent a way to solve a problem with a kid. It's just that with plan A, the problem solving process is unilateral. That's where the adult is deciding what the solution is and imposing it on the kid. 
It's also the cause of a lot of concerning behaviors. Plan B is where you're solving the problem collaboratively. And that's how you're solving problems in this model. How do you solve a problem collaboratively? Three steps. They all take some getting used to, uh, especially if you were raised on plan A. Plan B is not gonna be second nature. This takes some getting used to. The three steps are called the empathy step, the define it all concern step, and the invitation step. What's going on in the empathy step? Information gathering. Gathering information from the kid about what's making it hard for the kid to meet a particular expectation. So just in the interest of time, I'm gonna give you my quick example of the empathy step. I gave this example during my talk this morning. It's one of my favorites though. I was doing a podcast with a father year and a half ago maybe, and he was telling me that his three-year-old daughter had been having difficulty brushing her teeth before going to bed at night. He thought he already knew why she was having difficulty brushing her teeth before she went to bed at night. He was sure that it was the taste of the toothpaste. So he was telling me eight to 10 different flavors of toothpaste later, she was still having difficulty brushing her teeth before she went to bed at night. Finally, he did the empathy step. Here's what's interesting. People often think, boy, this plan B stuff's gonna take a lot of time. Think of how much time this father spent trying to solve that problem before he did the empathy step. Plan B saves time. Uh, what did he learn from his daughter? Well, when he was brushing her teeth with the electric toothbrush before she went to bed at night, it was getting water all over her face. She didn't like getting water all over her face. As I said to him, well, now the, there's a concern that eight to 10 different flavors of toothpaste would never address. Define adult concern step. This is where the adult is entering their concern into consideration. The very same concern that might previously have led them into plan A is now leading them into plan B. What are we adults usually concerned about? How are the unsolved problems affecting the kid? Health, safety, learning, and or how the unsolved problems affecting other people? Health, safety, learning. What were the father's concerns? He, he didn't want his daughter to get cavities because it hurts to get them filled. That's how it was affecting, that's how it would affect his daughter and it would cost him a lot of money that he didn't really feel like spending. That's how it would affect him. We now have two sets of concerns on the table. No turning back now. The invitation is where kid and caregiver are putting their heads together, collaborating on a solution. Um, here's what it sounds like. I wonder if there's a way for us to make sure that your face doesn't get wet, her concern, and still make sure that you don't get cavities, which hurt to get filled and which cost me money I don't really wanna spend. You are then giving the kid the first crack at the solution. You got any ideas? Usually they do. She did, three years old. She recommended that they wrap a towel around her face while they were brushing her teeth before she went to bed at night. Now, as I'm always asking, who won? Both, both sets of concerns got addressed. That's what winning means in this model. Who lost? Nobody. Whose authority was undermined? Nobody's. That father was being an authority figure. Dr. Meter, you're up. Thank you. So I thought we would take this to a practical level to sort of maybe a, a typical child you might see in your office, uh, either as a family doctor or a pediatrician, and just kind of go through it a little bit about how this might work in a quick 10 minute visit versus say an hour long visit if you are doing full consultation. I'll just, before we before I do that though, um, uh, Laura or Jessica, I noticed that if we, uh, go through our attendee list and allow people to talk, uh, click that on the list, then that might allow people to participate later on by just unmuting their microphone. So I wonder if maybe that's an option for encouraging some more participation as we wrap up uh, our session today. And even if there's questions during what we're about to talk right now. 
So I'll let you guys maybe work on that while, um, while I start this case presentation. So here it is. Uh, this, this kid might sound very familiar to you as some you may have seen walking in your office or uh, as in COVID-19 show up on your uh, telemedicine screen. Uh, Seven-year-old boy, um, we'll call him Oliver for now, he comes in with his mom. Uh, parents separated two years ago, spends every other weekend with his dad. And of course, he's got the five-year-old sister who's the polar opposite. How many times have you heard that, right? Uh, that's how we knew we were having issues because his sister is an angel. And so uh, we see this vast difference already set up in the family about how to manage behavior. Um, otherwise healthy boy, but there's a family history of ADHD. So they come with some preconceived ideas of what a diagnosis means and how important or unimportant it might be. Um, and of course the school is often the first to alert parents like, hey, you've got a real problem here because the school is gonna be more structured. There's gonna be more expectations. And if kids are gonna have difficulty meeting expectations, oftentimes it's school where it first shows up. So in this case, the teacher said, look, he's not doing his work. He just, def he's defiant. Um, and uh, whenever somebody in authority asks him to do something or complete something or complete a task in a class, he just says no. And in fact, sometimes it gets so bad that he's easily upset and he starts flipping desks. All right, now I have four kids myself and I hear about the desk flippers from my kids, all right? These kids get so upset, they don't know how to respond. We see this tip of the iceberg behavior just kind of come out of nowhere, it seems like, because it's a little minor thing usually that just results in things being thrown off the desk or the kid running out of the classroom. Furthermore, they said, the teacher said, you need to get him checked out for ADHD. He's fidgeting all the time, he can't stop moving. And in the, class, in the, in the playground at recess, He's bossy and manipulative. So it's hard for him to maintain friends. His academics are starting to suffer. You know, you better take him to your family doctor or your pediatrician to get checked out. We've tried everything we did here. You know, we've given him some sensory breaks. We allow him to kind of take breaks out of the classroom or go to the principal's office just to take a break. We've got an EA with him that's introduced his checklist where if he has good behavior two or three times a day, then there's a little reward at the end. Or if it's you know, if the score is overwhelmingly positive that day, there is a reward in store. It's not working. That's why we need you to see your family doctor or your pediatrician right away. And when mom reflects on this, she's noticed the exact, noticed the exact same at home. Um, he's also defiant of authority there. Furthermore, he doesn't sleep. And he's and whenever they try to introduce screen time, um, good luck. That's when the meltdown happens at home. The, not the desk that flipped, but you know, a bowl of cereal might go flying across the kitchen. He's just explosive. So you can imagine how frustrating this is for the family. And then of course, when he's at dad's house, there's absolutely no concerns, no problems here. So it makes you wonder, like maybe the expectations are different at the different places, who knows, but he's also sure that he does not want the kid on medications. So um, go figure out some other way to deal with this. So here you are, this is not a typical problem. I'm sure you've seen this before. What can you possibly do in a 10 or 15 minute? Well, you can actually do a lot. You can actually do a lot of meaningful things. Caregivers mean they often wanna talk about behavior. And yes, it's okay to hear about that briefly, but after all, the, the, the kid sitting in front of you has probably spent years hearing about his behavior problems. So we need to put on different lenses as what Dr. Green was talking about earlier. We need to start seeing this behavior really as the tip of the iceberg and ask ourselves and ask the parents, what's underneath this behavior and what's the story behind the behavior, All right? You wanna shift the family and your own default tendency to think about a specific diagnosis perhaps, you know, which really is just a list of symptoms, i.e. behaviors and you know, what medication might be indicated for that diagnosis. That might be where your mind is going to right now, right away. But really, you know, how does that help the family to walk out of the office with a, letter, a set of letters like an ADHD or ODD or whatever the diagnosis might be, they've really moved no further ahead than when they walked in and actually addressing the problem. So get them talking about the problems that are causing those behaviors. In other words, ask them, what expectations is Oliver having difficulty meeting when those behaviors occur. What are the actual problems that occur when, and, and, and these occur when there is a gap or incompatibility between the child's skills and abilities and our 
expectations and demands. So try to be as specific as you can here, all right? For example, with Oliver, well, he won't do schoolwork we're asking him to do, right? He distracts the other kids in the class by constantly moving. Those are real tangible problems. He bosses other kids around at recess and he, he upsets the other kids. Or he becomes physical when he can't do something he wants to do or when we ask him to put his device away. For example, at home, right? When mom asks him to put the iPad away because it's time for dinner. That's when he explodes. So those are some real tangible, specific problems we can try and address. And then help them recognize that these problems are predictable. So ask them. Here's, here's, here's a great line to ask. Is this the first time that all of us had difficulty meeting that expectation? And caregivers and teachers, when asked that question, they realize that these problems aren't just predictable, they're highly predictable, right? Ask yourselves when and what situations do these problems occur? And most parents will say that the behavior is completely out of the blue, all right? It's like we're walking on eggshells, but a little bit of drilling down, a little bit of detective work, a little bit of asking the kid, right? Collaborative, uh, reveals that things are often much more predictable and triggered by similar circumstances each and every time. This is a predictable problem that we need to help the child solve. So, uh, and, and some kids, you know, they might have difficulty, might have difficulty doing that detective work. Like for a kid with autism, for example, who might have a very long memory for certain triggered situations, which may seem minor to us. So, Parents who are really attuned to their kids can help figure this out. And we would encourage all parents to really help and help their kids figure this out. What are the situations, the predictable situations? So help them understand also that the, that the child's concerning behaviors are due to lagging skills rather than lagging motivation, which is why traditional discipline hasn't been effective, right? So um, rewards and punishments don't solve any problems or teach any skills. So what is all of her in this situation actually having difficulty with it is self-regulation, is it executive function skills such as adapting to change in plans, is it transitions so of shifting from one uh, preferred activity to a non-preferred activity, like come on in for recess because we've got to work on math. Well, if that results in a behavior, then that's what he's having difficulty with. So, or maybe it's communicating frustration, maybe it's a language difficulty. All right, so these then are the, are the real, the specific lagging skills which predictably lead to problems, you know, which, which, which result in behavior that we see. This is the tip of the iceberg that we're seeing um, when we address the, the lagging skills, the iceberg underneath the water, all right? So we can punish the behavior all we want, you know, we could, but unless we address the lagging skills, I mean, nothing's gonna change and the, the kids will keep behaving badly to let you know that they can't meet our expectations. So, uh, and then move the discussion to specific lagging skills and unsolved problems. Introduce the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems. If they can do it on their own, fantastic. You know, you're gonna prescribe access to some of these resources, livesinabalance.org, tons of resources there, available for free. You know, you don't need to, to purchase them. They're all right there. Lots of great examples and videos that you can point parents to and say, look, I think you can do this at home. You've done that in 10 or 15 minutes, you may have really made a huge dramatic difference. And if they need help, then you wanna maybe refer to a counselor or a therapist who can work with the kids in this area, spend some more time with them uh, on, on the unsolved problems and on the lagging skills, and then introduce them to the ALSA. So here, here it is, at, uh, at the last talk, Dr. Green introduced the new ALSA uh, for 2020, uh, some changes there. But again, downloadable for free, available on the Lives in a Balance website. You know, this would be a great way to start identifying where the kids are having some of these difficulties. Dr. Green, anything else you want to say about that specifically? Uh, only that this is not in the top part of the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems are 18 lagging skills. It's not exhaustive, not even close, but it's very persuasive. It helps caregivers say, wow, he really is lacking a lot of skills. In the bottom section is where we are writing in or typing in because this is available in an editable, fillable format on the Lives in a Balance website, um, what expectations this kid is having difficulty meeting. What are the unsolved problems? And there are prompts to help people identify unsolved problems. There are prompts that one would use if one was dealing with folks in a school or facility. And there's prompts that one would use if one was working with folks from the home or in a clinic. 
what the ELSA gives you once again is the information that's been missing. And so you can expect many aha moments from caregivers as they're sitting there saying, this stuff was right there. How come I didn't, how come I wasn't dealing with this? They might say, how come I didn't know about this? And you might say, well, no one's ever helped you really focus on this before, but we're focused on it now because what we have now is the raw material that's going to help us help your child in a completely different way than what you might have been doing so far. Absolutely. And so, yeah, you know, rather than coming up with a bunch of uh, acronyms for whatever we think might be alien, and these might be useful, absolutely. Like we don't want to dis, dis a diagnostic process altogether, but if that's all you're left with, it isn't much. You know, we, we have not solved the problems. We have not uh, really address the behavior in a meaningful and long-term way that's going to stick. So I think that's what, that's what the difference is um, the, um, from our traditional maybe approach of a diagnosis and then, and then kind of moving on to a quick fix like medication. So let's move on to the next slide there. So if you have more time, you know, there, uh, then, then really go through that also. You're not going to, that's going to be tough to do in a 10 or 15 minute visit. And you may have to refer on to someone who can, who can help you with that completion, whether it's someone at the school or someone in your family health team or someone just in your office who, who, who can spend more time doing this. But it'd be so great if you had the time to do this with your family and start, um, and start with an approach to plan B for one or two or three of these problems and say, how can we actually solve this so that you know, we can address the behavior? You'd be amazed that you know, if, even if we took two or three of these main issues that come up, main problems that come up, how much uh, of a difference that can make in a child's life and that's gonna be meaningful and long lasting. Remember, if it's unilaterally imposed, it's not gonna stick. But if it's collaboratively arrived at, it's much, much, much more likely to stick in the long term. Now, I'm going to jump in for just a second here. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah. Um, we had a question come up in the chat. Um, and I, I do want to remind all of the attendees to please put questions into the Q&A section. Um, but the question was, can you talk a bit about how to use the LSEP for different age groups? For example, kindergarten versus late school age. No different. It's identical. Unsolved problems or unsolved problems, lagging skills or lagging skills. Um, if a particular lagging skill, if you're sitting there thinking, I wouldn't even expect that in a three-year-old, skip that lagging skill. But the goal is the same. Help caregivers recognize that this kid is lacking skills, not motivation, and that there are some very specific unsolved problems that are giving rise to the, challenge, to the concerning behaviors. And if we solve those problems, the concerning behaviors that are associated with them will subside, as it says up there in quotes, it's only unsolved problems that cause concerning behaviors. Solved problems don't. What I was about to say was that, depending on the amount of time that you have, you may only have time to provide an overview of the three steps of plan B, and then refer them to the Lives in the Balance website so they can see video of what it looks like. But if you have the time, you could try the empathy step and say, Let, let's see how this goes, Tommy. I've heard from your mom that you sometimes have difficulty um, eating what she's made for dinner. What's up? That's what the empathy step sounds like when you're starting it. Let's say the kid says, she always makes stuff I don't like. Now you're modeling the empathy step. She always makes stuff you don't like. Help me understand that better. She knows I hate meat and that's all she cooks. Ah, interesting. All she cooks is meat. And let's say the mother now interrupts. I'm not a short order chef, mom. Your turn comes in the second step. Here in this first step, we're just trying to find out what's making it hard for your son to meet your expectation of him eating what you've made for dinner. And I'm hearing some very informative things here, things that are actually going to help us solve this problem. We don't know what it's gonna look like yet, but what I'm hearing is that your son doesn't like meat and that from his perception, at least, that's pretty much all you make. Let's keep going. That's what it might sound like to provide an example. This does not have to be super formal, 
But what you're proving to the adults is that um, there is very important information to be gathered from the child if we just try to do that. And the child might be quite surprised initially when you do that for the first time because it's not happened before. And so you may not get, you might get a hesitant response at first, but if you stick with it, I think uh, it'll be much appreciated by the child to actually have some input input into meeting some of these unmet uh, expectations. So maybe uh, Dr. Green, maybe you can then kind of walk us through kind of plan B. We got, already did, we talked about empathy already, um, but then the next two steps, defining adult concerns and the invitation. Well, what this graphic is telling us is that when you are using plan B, you are not just solving problems and you are not just reducing the likelihood of concerning behaviors, you are also just through the process of engaging a child in plan B, teaching the child many of the skills that the child may be lacking. And so what this graphic shows you in the three boxes are the different skills that are being practiced, modeled, and enhanced in each of the three steps of plan B. Um, now, what might the mother's concern have been in the define it all concern step? And, you know, if you've got time in your office, you can do that too. Mom, I bet you've got some concerns about Tommy not eating what you've made for dinner. What are your concerns? And mom, your concerns are going to re be related to either how the problem's affecting Tommy or how the problem's affecting other people. Well, I've never thought about this before, but uh, my concern is that I want to make sure that Tommy eats a nutritious diet and that I'm not like asked to cook something different every night for Tommy. Great. Now let's move into the invitation. Now we're gonna give Tommy the first crack at the solution. Tommy, I wonder if there's a way for us to, for you not to have to eat meat for dinner. That was his concern. And by the way, the empathy step would have gone further to see if he had any other concerns. And also make sure that your mom doesn't have to cook something for you on the spur of the moment that's completely different than what you made everybody else for dinner and that you eat a nutritious dinner. You got any ideas? Kid gets the first crack. Well, I don't mind all meats. Like I could eat chicken nuggets if you wants me to eat meat. Now we are rolling, the process of coming up with solutions is rolling out. Um, if this problem gets solved, there won't be any concerning behaviors about this problem anymore. Yeah, and, and you know, another useful thing would be to see, well, what, you know, what were the parents, how, how, what's their view of parenting, you know, because many of them may not, this is we seem foreign to them, plan B. It seems like you're being a pushover or you're letting the child have kind of all the say uh, because, and even we as physicians maybe grew up with plan A ourselves. And it seems like that's the natural thing that, you know, cause we're wiser, we're smarter, uh, we're adults, right? So we should have the answers uh, for our kids. You know, what, 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 what do they know? They're only four or five years old. Well, you'd be surprised sometimes the kind of solutions that kids come up with if we just let them. And again, a, a collaboratively arrived at solution is much, much more likely to stick than a unilaterally imposed solution. So, but it is still important that we as, as physicians, you know, we take a full history, right? Because sometimes, you know, there can be other issues which, which can lead to lagging skills. If there's a history of trauma or, you know, if there's attachment difficulties uh, which affect the relationship between the, the parent and a child, I mean, these can all affect your approach that you might take with that family and may require you know, some therapy in other areas as well, right? So that's part of our kind of more full holistic view of the behavior problems that we see. You know, what's interesting is that, um, and we do have a question in the Q&A that we can answer as well. As it relates to trauma-informed care, um, a lot of people say that what trauma-informed care has done well is help us understand the ACEs, understand what many kids have gone through, understand why they're getting so upset so easily. But a lot of people say that the what you do about it part is what you're hearing about right now. 
Mm -hmm. So here, let's, let's go to the question if that's okay. Uh, it says, you have addressed a method to outline identifying the unsolved problems in a collaborative fashion. I'm wondering if you can comment on successful techniques to teach strategies to the more success, for the more challenging children seen in our practices with difficulties such as anxiety, anger, self-regulation, particularly for older boys that often do not respond to talking strategies offered through most community partners? Well, here's my answer. Anxiety, anger, self-regulation difficulties, those are signals. In and of themselves, those are not unsolved problems. Kids often aren't gonna talk about anxiety, anger, self-regulation difficulties. But when we get to the level of a specific expectation that the kid is having difficulty meeting, whether that's homework or getting off the Xbox to come into dinner or double masking or whatever, um, what's interesting is now they do talk. Number one, they don't feel like they're in trouble. Number two, because this is a collaborative process, they don't feel like the boom is about to get lowered. So they are much more comfortable with this process. It is so common for me to be introduced to a kid who I'm told won't talk. And it is almost, well, I'm, I'm so close to saying never, but just to hedge my bets, because I can't remember the last one who wouldn't talk, it is almost never that the kid would not talk, especially when we change the focal point of what it is that we want the kid to talk about. But here's the interesting thing. I wouldn't call this talk therapy. This is problem solving. Uh, if this is, kid is not much of a talker, if this kid is a reluctant talker, uh, we, there's lots of strategies we can use so that this whole thing can play out with very, very little talking. There's the answer to that one. Uh, here's you, some of the, go ahead. Oh, hi there. I was the one who had asked the question. Um, uh, I'm a pediatrician. It's actually not so much that they wouldn't um, talk per se, that they would just um, sit there. It's that I've had a lot of feedback from kids where, again, I can get them to talk to me, but I'm not actually the quote unquote behavioral therapist, where they just say that it is so boring for them to go and, you know, listen to someone who's trying to help them learn these techniques and the tools. And I do feel they have to learn tools. They can identify perhaps what some of the issues are, but they need to be equipped with how to manage those emotions, those normal frustrations um, when they're having challenges meeting expectations and they just don't find it very engaging. And I, I don't think boys often do. They don't wanna sit there and you know color sheets and talk to a person. They, they want to do actions. And I've just not found a lot of techniques that resonate very, very well with boys versus girls who often are much more into let's discuss and talk and hash it out. So I, I've just found a bit of a gap actually in some of the resources to really equip our boys. Well, I, I guess my attitude is it depends on what some of those resources are. Um, uh, yes, there are, although I'm working with a girl right now who is a reluctant talker, uh, also a boy right now who is a reluctant talker, I, I would have trouble breaking it down by gender in terms of who my reluctant talkers are. What's interesting is this is a very active process and the kid is fully engaged in it. It's actually, believe it or not, not something that you are actively teaching to the kid. It's actually something that you are doing with the kid and that the kid is learning and becoming, having muscle memory about over time. Um, so it's not sort of didactic. It's more, let's get this problem solved so y'all can stop fighting about it. I guess I find that a lot of kids, male and female, find this process to be very different from what they've experienced previously in therapy, maybe because it's as active as it is. The kid is engaged in this process right from the get-go. The kid is not a passive recipient of adult knowledge and instruction. The kid is engaged right from the beginning. And here's the interesting thing, as it relates to strategies, what does a kid need to know how to do when there's a problem in life that's causing them to become frustrated? They need to know how to solve that problem. And another thing, Miriam, specifically that I find is helpful is when these kids are movers and they need to 
you feel like they just know to do something active, do something active when you're doing this. Like I have to have a couple of patients who I, do, I actually go for walks with and talk while we walk and we don't look at each other eye to eye. Uh, you can also do this when you're driving in a car. You know, a parent can do this when you're going for a drive and you're sitting beside each other kind of moving and going places. And uh, I know that there might be other ways that this kid is going to be more reachable and more likely to respond um, that the parent might know about or the child might even suggest like, hey, let's go do something instead of sitting here across from each other. Take them up on it. That, that'd be one way to solve that problem. Oops. Uh, thanks. So Rob, should we cover a few before we run out of time of the myths and pushback that people are going to get? Sure. Or yeah. in lieu of that, we can also see if there are any other questions from people. And if you do have a question, maybe raise your hand in the chat and we can allow you to talk if you want to pose your question. And maybe while you're thinking of a question, um, we can attack one of these myths and well, <laughs> want to do that. Here we go. The CPS model excuses and enables kids who willfully misbehave. Uh, my answer to that is this kid is not willfully misbehaving. Unless that's, that's not what the research is telling us. And there is nothing excusing and enabling about this model in terms of continuing to support kids in their willful misbehavior. Lagging skills are not an excuse. They are an evidence-based explanation for why this kid is responding so maladaptively to life's problems and frustrations. I think we've covered bullet number two satisfactorily here. Kids will never participate in problem solving. Uh, you know, I've got one right now who's challenging all my skills, but um, I find that that is almost never the case, even though I hear it a lot. Solving problems collaboratively takes too long nowhere nearly as long as it took to buy eight to 10 different flavors of toothpaste and still not have the problem be solved. Kids need to know that there are consequences for misbehavior. There are consequences for misbehavior, natural consequences. If we add adult imposed consequences, that's all well and good, but consequences solve no problems and teach no skills so we still may be missing the mark. Bad kids are due to bad parenting. I thought that early in my training and then I started working with a whole bunch of parents of kids with concerning behaviors who had other children in their home who were well behaved. That turned out to be a myth. Wow, well, I didn't know you were gonna cover all six in three minutes. That was it can be done. It can be done. <laughs> So good. So maybe I mean, there's a few questions here. Uh, if people want to comment, uh, let us know. But if not, we are coming towards the end of our, our hour here. Um, resources are available at livesinthebalance.org. Any other resources that you might, uh, website you might point us to, Dr. Green? Uh, the best thing for parents is the walking tour on the Lives in the Balance website. It's all kinds of streaming video and audio programming to walk them through this model and help them understand all of what we've been talking about in this relatively brief period of time. All the resources on the Lives in the Balance website are free and there's a whole bunch of them. Great. Well, thank you. Um, if there's no further uh, comments or questions, we will leave it at that. I hope this has been useful for you as a, as a physician or a clinician working in this area. Um, you know, there's a lot you can do in 10 or 15 minutes to change the lenses and change the direction of the conversation to really start moving away from the tip of the iceberg behaviors to what's underneath the service causing the unsolved problems. And if you have more time as a, as a consultant pediatrician, you know, take some time to dig a little bit deeper and start modeling that empathy step and that invitation uh, step to see if we can actually address some of the problems right there and really do something meaningful and practical for the family to, uh, to help uh, you know, change some of those behaviors that brought them there in the first place. Thanks, Dr. Green, for, um, for, for, for being with us today. I really appreciate that. There's some links there in the chat and hopefully we can do it again sometime. Thank you for inviting me and thank you all for joining in. 
Thank you.